So we heard a talk about protein. And that's when people end up going over to a whole food plant-based diet, everybody asks, where are you going to get your protein from? So Dr. O'Connor and I are going to talk about that. Next slide. So the biggest question is people think that, you know, if you're just eating vegetables and fruits and legumes and things like that, do they contain all the protein you need and all the essential amino acids? And we'll answer that during this talk. Next slide. Um, they also want to know, like, are you getting enough protein? Even if these do have protein, is it anywhere comparable to meat? And we'll talk about that. Next slide. So we start with, you know, if you eat animals, first of all, where are the biggest animals in the world, the strongest, the hardiest get their protein from? And they get it from grass, greens. So, you know, we can do the same, but that's, you know, think if, if people ask, you know, how do you, you know, you're, I, I remember seeing something on um, the game changers the, of the strongest man in the world, one of the strongest men in the world, you know, where do you, how do you, how are you strong as an ox when you don't eat ox? And he said, well, ox don't eat ox, they eat grass, basically. So this is, um, we're gonna emphasize where the animals get their protein and where we do. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna start with what is a protein? So a protein is a complex molecule, and we'll show you a picture of that, that's made up of amino acids. Um, there are 20 amino acids, but nine are essential. And this seems to be the issue with, you know, people concerned about um, others being on a whole food plant-based diet that, you know, you can't get all of the essential amino acids. Um, and we're here to show you that that is not true. You can get all nine essential amino acids um, and all plant foods, uh, whether it's vegetable, you know, root vegetable, fruits, uh, nuts, seeds, grains do contain all nine essential amino acids. There was a myth that was actually debunked that you needed to combine uh, proteins. That is no, that's not true. Um, so while you can eat your corn with your beans and your squash, that's great. It's yummy. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that to get all of the nine essential amino acids. Um, it is true that some foods contain higher amounts of certain amino acids than others, but that's the benefit of eating a whole food plant-based variety, eat the rainbow diet. So you can get a good balance of all of those amino acids. So you can see here what the nine are, histamine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and valine. Um, the three branch chain amino acids that Dr. Scheuer will talk about shortly are isoleucine, leucine, and valine. Next slide, please. So here, um, this is kind of an interesting um, slide showing the, um, the different amino acids and what plants are high in that particular amino acid. Um, so first on the list is histamine. So if you're on a low histamine diet because you're affected by histamine, maybe these are some of the foods that you want to avoid. Uh, one of the things I found interesting that was pretty consistent through most of the groups was lentils. Um, so we talk about kale being a superfood. I really think that lentils is kind of a superfood um, for many, many reasons. Um, but we looked down and isoleucine, leucine, um, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, valine, all have a good variety of nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables. There's an asterisk on phenylalanine. Um, this is tested for every newborn. Um, it's a rare, rare, rare genetic disorder in the gene that codes for phenylalanine hydroxylase, which breaks down um, phenylalanine. And um, you would know if you had it at birth. Um, so it's not anything you need to be worried about as an adult um, because it would have been detected um, by current standards um, at, uh, as, at a newborn stage. Next slide. So again, kale, you know, we talk about kale being a superfood. It's a really great food. Um, and look at these. It does contain all nine essential amino acids, but these are the ones it's highest in. Um, uh, the isoleucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, and valine. Next slide. So a protein is a molecule that's made up of four components, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And you can see a singular molecule here. The R on the molecule is a side chain, and that's where other, um, this is actually a, a single amino acid where others would uh, join together to form peptides, and then peptides form a large protein chain. 
And then when it goes through the digestive process, those proteins are broken down into singular amino acids again. Next slide, please. So you can see the next uh, photograph here, or the next um, image here. So those amino acids that are broken down are then reassembled um, as the body needs it into peptides and then into proteins. Um, and it's interesting that uh, proteins, other than DNA that's in our body, um, the average life of protein is less than two days. It's two days or less in our body. So our body is using these, right? Um, and they're absorbed into the small intestine is the primary area of absorption in the body. Um, a couple of examples um, would be like uh, the amino acids coming together form like creatine and collagen. Uh, creatine is needed for muscle growth and repair. A lot of talk about creatine. A lot of people take creatine supplements, um, but it can actually be quite damaging to your kidneys because our, our body makes its own creatine. And there is some discussion that if you're taking a lot of exogenous or from the outside creatine, um, that it can actually uh, prevent production of our own endogenous within our body production of creatine. Um, another one, uh, well, and then also on creatine, uh, we make it from three amino acids and only one of those is essential. The other two are non-essential, meaning our body makes those, and that's methionine, um, which is the non-essential. Uh, uh, creatine is sort of uh, phosphocreatine, and that's what we use for like bursts of energy. And here's some, you know, sources, uh, pumpkin, watermelon, and sesame seeds, spirulina, nuts, legumes, veggies, and greens. One thing I wanted to point out, there's a lot of talk about collagen supplements, collagen for the skin, hair and nails. The, the, our body doesn't really absorb collagen and the collagen that we take in gets broken down just like the schematic on the bottom into amino acids. Those amino acids then form whatever peptide is needed and then forms a protein, but it does not get reassembled as the collagen that we swallowed. So there may be no benefit to actually taking it in exogenously. So we don't absorb it in the form that we swallow it. So um, it's. Uh, I think people need to be aware of that uh, because sometimes we take supplements and we take things thinking that we're getting 100% of the benefit. There's There may not be with um, collagen. Next slide, please. So the function of proteins. <clears throat> proteins are very important for us for structure, function, regulation of our tissues. Um, there is at least 10,000 in our bodies to support life. And remember that side chain, some of them contain minerals like iron for hemoglobin, which is important for bringing oxygen around your body, selenium that protects us from cancer. So, oops. Um, and uh, they are, there's, they're also used as antibodies to protect us from viruses and bacteria. They're used to catalyze chemical reactions in our body. And they're also used as transporters of atoms and other molecules. So protein is very important, but the, and so I'm, we're, we're absolutely saying we need protein, but we kind of focus on that too much sometimes. Next slide. So here's some fun facts about protein. Uh, it comes from the word proteus, which means primary or first rank. It's essential to life, which we just um, described, but 18 to 20% of our body is protein. Protein's lifespan, as Dr. Curie mentioned, was is two days or less, or Dr. O'Connor mentioned, and um, our DNA is the exception in terms of uh, due to long life, lifelong repair mechanisms, but it helps us feel full sometimes, so it helps increase satiety. So having eating protein does help us feel full. Bodies would swell without it. Um, it helps us keep from sweat the waters in our vessels and not swell. And you can think about people in um, foreign, in third world countries that have kwashiorkor with the big bellies that don't get enough uh, calories. So they don't get enough protein and that's the swelling in the bellies. That's true protein deficiency. People talk a lot about sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle loss. And people think that they need more protein for that, but it's actually exercise that is needed, not necessarily more protein for sarcopenia. You need um, strength training. There's a, a UK twin study, which showed that twins who were fed a lot of protein as they aged, if they were fed more protein, they actually had less muscle strength than if they were fed less protein. So it is absolutely the, I, the thing that you need to move 
rather than focus on protein to stop from becoming, um, having muscle loss as we age. We need to move more. Um, protein is also a very poor fuel source. People think that they need protein for fuel, but that's not true. The primary fuel in, a, in our bodies is carbohydrates. Then fats, we do not store protein. So it's a very bad fuel store, source for us. Next slide. Okay, so how much protein do we really need? Um, really some qu questions you need to consider and ask yourself is how much protein am I actually getting? Why do I think I need more protein? And who are you comparing yourself to? There's a lot of people out there saying protein, 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 but are they reading the research? Are they just parroting what they heard from somebody else? Um, is it really evidence-based? You really have to look at the evidence. Um, and can more protein than recommended be harmful to me? These are really good questions you need to really ask. Um, and again, as Dr. Scheuer just mentioned that protein is not a good fuel source. Um, we have infinite capacity to store fat. We have limited capacity to store carbohydrate and we have almost zero capacity to store protein. Um, so, you know, again, what's the best way to build muscle? Dr. Scheuer just talked about that through the UK twin study um, that actually more protein can lead to uh, muscle wasting and muscle loss. Um, it can increase the sarcopenia. Really, we need resistance training, right? Free weights, resistance machines, resistance bands, TRX, things like that. And then ask yourself, like, how much protein can I really digest at one time when you grab that muscle milk out of the refrigerator that maybe has 50 grams of protein per serving, you know, and you're eating it with a big meal? Like, what really happens to all that excess protein? Is my body really using it? Um, and then what are we missing from primarily focusing on protein? And we'll try and answer some of these questions. Next slide, please. So how much protein do I need? Here we get into some technical stuff, okay? Um, they've figured out that we need about 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. How did they figure that out? They, they figured out the RDA is 0.66 grams per kilogram per day. That's what the average person needs. Then they put two standard deviations higher than that and came up with 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. So that is 97.5%. grams per kilogram per day in in general, then you're prob probably getting too much even, or a, a, more than you need. Um, you certainly need more as uh, a toddler. Now, babies, it's interesting that only 5% of the calories from breast milk is, is protein. They need more fat than they need protein. And so, and that's a time of growth. Toddlers do need more protein than, than adults. Children and adolescents also do. And so do certain athletes and pregnant women and lactation, you need a little bit more. So, um, and seniors do too. Again, it, we need a tiny bit more as we get older, but it's really the, um, the resistance training for the sarcopenia. And then athletes, they've, they've discovered like long distance athletes need more, like about 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. And bodybuilders need at least, you know, about 1.6 grams per kilogram per day. But there's new studies that say that you can't even build muscle if you have more than 1.6 grams per kilogram. So it, there's leeway. Next slide. Um, and it's interesting, I forgot to mention on the last slide, uh, people who are plant-based and have a lot of, of fiber that can affect protein digestibility. So we do add about 10% uh, if you have a hugely fiber diet. If you are a plant-based eater who eats a lot of tofu, that doesn't have a lot of fiber. So you can still go with a 0.8 but, uh, grams per kilogram per day. But if you um, are plant-based with a lot of fiber, you might wanna go a little bit more. So math, yuck, here we go. We talk about um, how much you need. If you are a 165 pound person, you divide that by 2.2 to get kilograms, uh, and that would be about 75 kilograms. Then you go 75 times 0.8, which is 60 grams of protein a day. Again, if you're plant-based, a little bit more, so that would be about 66 grams of, of uh, protein. <laughs> or we also describe protein in percent of calories. So protein has four calories per gram. You eat 66 grams because you're a whole food plant-based eater. Um, then 66 grams times four calories is 264 calories from 
in a 2,500 calorie diet, which is pretty normal for somebody that's 165 pounds and active, then that would be 10% of your calories from protein. And that is probably ideal is 10% of calories from protein. You don't necessarily need more of that. So when you hear people talk about protein, you can look at it grams per kilogram or percentage of calories from protein. Next slide. Oh, that's out of order. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> Runaway slides. Yeah, they're getting ahead of us. Here, okay, there we go. All right. So oh, risk is sorry, I there's an amateur working the slides. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Back to training for you, sir. <laughs> All right. Risk is risks of excess protein. It's a tongue twister for me tonight. Um, so again, our bodies can only um digest approximately 25 to 30 grams of protein at a time. Um, so if you're looking at your daily caloric intake of say 66 grams of protein, you know, if you had 20 to 22 grams of protein at a meal, you would definitely be within that range. Um, but if you're over that, uh, I'll show you a slide, a picture on, on what happens. So excess, um, protein is stored as fat or glucose. It can be eliminated, um, but can also be very damaging to the kidneys. Um, but excess protein can lead to fatty liver and obesity. And again, I'll show you that slide. Uh, Christopher Gardner is a wonderful nutrition researcher. If no one has uh, ever had the pleasure of listening to him, he's been on Rich Roll. Um, he has done some other online podcasts specifically talking about protein. Um, and he estimated that if we cut back 25% on our protein intake, we would still be getting enough. Um, T. Colin Campbell, of course, you know, his foundational book, The China Study, casein happens to be the most toxic um, of all the proteins, and that's found in dairy. And um, they've done studies showing if you're above uh, 15 to 20%, I think the number is 20%, um, it will turn on cancer genes. And if you're below 20%, um, it doesn't. Uh, so it's re so staying in the range of what Dr. Scheuer talked about, about 10, 10, uh, percent of your, 10 to 15% of your protein intake or your, your total caloric intake from proteins is very appropriate. Um, but dairy happens to be um, really toxic to our system. Uh, lower protein, um, animal protein intake and higher whole food plant-based protein intake. And I say whole food emphasis, unprocessed is associated with lower rates of cancer. There are a lot of highly processed and ultra processed um, vegan or whole food plant-based foods out there that are almost as bad, if not worse than some of the animal products. So you really want a minimally to almost no processed um, whole food plant-based diet. Two grams per kilogram of day of meat protein intake um, associated with an increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Um, and there's an association with cardiovascular disease. But after we put this slide together, I thought a lot about this one today. Um, so it's not just cardiovascular disease, so CVD, but it can also be cerebrovascular disease, right? Um, because we there are a lot of studies now and investigations going on with um, Alzheimer's and dementia. And so when we eat a lot of um, animal products in our diet, it will raise our LDL cholesterol. It drives atherosclerosis and the complexity of the atherosclerotic plaque, but it's not specific to the heart. It will do the penile vessels, the vessels in the brain. So we talk a lot about heart disease because we can't function without one, um, but it, it, it chooses vessels, not just heart vessels. So it's very important that people understand that. And then saturated fat really is a proxy for um, animal protein intake and risk of cancer. Next slide, please. So here's, a, this slide is really fun and interesting. Um, so it shows that when we take dietary protein in our gut, right, it's absorbed by the small intestine, it's broken into its amino acids, and you can see um, some goes off as carbon dioxide, some proteins are reassembled for the body, but some of the essential nitrogen containing compounds that come off of that molecule, remember it had four components, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. When that nitrogen comes off, you're left with three components, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and that's a carbohydrate. So a carbohydrate means a carbon that's been hydrated. And look what happens. It gets stored, um, if you follow the down arrows, in the liver, excess amino acids get, get stored as triglycerides, triacylglycerols, triacylglycerols or VLDL, 
um, which can increase fatty liver, right? Also gets stored as glucose, excess energy, excess calories, right? We know excess energy, excess calories can lead to overweight and obesity syndromes. So um, again, some of the glucose will go into the blood for energy, and then some of the proteins are reassembled for energy for the cells. Next slide, please. So we talk about proteins importantly that they, if you have too much, it increases all cause mortality. They've been in studies on people 50 to 65 who consume the high protein diets, like 20% or more of the calories, increases all, all cause mortality 74%. Now, remember, if you have 66 grams um, at 165 pounds, that would be about 100. 32 grams, you know, or 120 if you're eating animal protein. And many people get that much. So it's interesting, though, that they found that this, these associations with all cause mortality were eliminated or diminished if the proteins were from plants. So you don't have to worry about so much with plants, but you do, you don't, at least the all cause mortality, you do have to worry about the weight if you have too much protein eating plants, but it's really the animal products. And um, most people get twice what's really recommended in this country. Numerous studies have shown a drop in overall mortality. If you change even just 3% of your calories from animal protein to plant protein, and that, that decrease in mortality improves with time. And it is even more important with processed animal, pro animal protein. So bacon, and salamis and bologna, you know, all those processed animal proteins, if you can replace those with 3% of plant-based proteins, your all-cause all mortality improves significantly, almost 50%. So that's really important. And there's some studies, um, many studies show that there's an increase in cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, all that stuff, if you're eating more animal versus plant. Next slide. Okay, risk factors for protein deficiency, they do exist. Generally speaking, we do not have an issue of protein deficiency in the country, at least in the United States. However, there are certain categories, people that have had like a total colectomy, severe malabsorption uh, syndromes like celiac disease, Crohn's, intestinal damage, um, things that have like a gastric bypass, like a Roux and Y, where it's really changed. It's sort of like replumbed your insides. Um, starvation is Dr. Scheuer talked about earlier, kwashiorkor that we'll find in low income countries, um, severe burn victims, um, people with pancreatic damage, intestinal parasites. Um, we typically will find that again in low income countries, not in the United States, not really endemic here. Um, hyperemesis gravidum of pregnancy. Um, that's uh, a lot of nausea and vomiting, which is very severe complication of pregnancy. Um, folks who are elderly, they have a naturally low um, appetite, so they're not taking in as much food. Uh, people who are on a very restricted raw food um, are strictly fruititarian diet. Um, there is fruit and protein, or, or I'm sorry, protein and fruit, um, but you need a good variety of all the, um, you know, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes um, within the whole food plant-based world. Um, people with severe eating disorders like severe anorexia, um, and then diets exclusively of junk or ultra processed foods that you would find in food deserts. Next slide. Signs of protein deficiency. You notice like hair color change to a yellow or orange, brittle hair and nails. And this is beyond what you might find with somebody who's hypothyroid. Um, edema, again, that belly swelling um, that Dr. Scheuer talked about, that's part of kwashiorkor. Um, severe muscle wasting and weakness, bone fractures, stress fractures, failure to thrive that can happen in infants, um, as well as um, across any age group, um, and severe lethargy. Next slide, please. So what's the scoop on protein and amino acid supplements? Well, Again, you've got to be incredibly careful with supplements because they're not recommended, regulated by the FDA. So you don't know what's really in them, what, if they're contaminated with stuff, where the product came from, et cetera, et cetera. You can look at the ODS. This is a website up here um, where you can get some more information on safer supplements and, and things to be careful of. But there are so many professional body uh, athletes who just eat more calories and don't supplement. In fact, I'm very active and I don't even consider supplementing and, and get plenty of protein in my diet because I checked it out on chronometer. And if you're concerned, you can go to chronometer.com and see that you're getting what you need. But, you know, Robert Cheek and um, vegan bodybuilders around the world, they, they a lot of them 
don't even sup supplement anymore because they just increase their calories. Uh, so, and that's similar for amino acids because um, again, if, there's, if you're getting them from supplements, you don't know what's really in them. And you've gotta be a little bit careful with amino acids if you're, they, they compete with each other. So supplementing a single amino acid could block the absorption of another amino acid. And this is herpes simplex is a good example. Some people know that lysine helps um, prevent outbreaks of herpes. Why? Because herpes needs arginine. So these are two different amino acids. Herpes needs arginine to, to, to function, but lysine competes with the arginine. So you add lysine, you, can, you block the arginine absorption. So that's what can happen with any single supplementation of an amino acid. You can block the absorption of other ones. Branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine are used a lot in, in um, building muscle. But again, only if you're doing the activity, you can't just eat things that have leucine, isoleucine, and valine and think you're gonna build muscle. You actually have to do the work. So um, it's better, I think, to supplement with hemp, peas, hemp seeds, peas, pumpkin seeds, and soy that have those in them, um, rather than getting branch chain amino acids in a supplement, which you don't know what's in it. Um, and again, 20 milligram doses, uh, 20 milligrams per day in divided doses for up to six weeks is considered safe, but not, you know, again, limited time period, not advised for pregnant and, and breastfeeding women because it can interfere, interfere with blood glucose levels, kidney and liver function. So just be careful. Next slide. So do plants have protein? Yes, 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 yes. All plants have protein and all plants have all of the amino acids in different things. And so the animals that we eat get their protein from the grass. So grass has all the essential amino acids too. All plants have all nine of the essential amino acids as we discussed, but in differing amounts. So if you ate only one plant all of your life, like only ate corn, you would be low in something. That's why we eat different plants at different parts of the day. And our goal is about 30 different, you know, rainbow colors of plants a week and to make sure you're getting a little bit of everything. The richest plant sources are all nine essential amino acids in a really high uh, amount and good um, balance is soy foods. So soybeans, tempeh tofu, lentils, peanuts, peas, um, seeds, nuts, pseudograins. Uh, and remember fruits and cereals and whole grains all have all nine essential amino acids, just different uh, levels and amounts. Next slide. So plant-based meat alternatives um, are big. Um, they may they may be sort of leveling off now, but there was, you know, they kind of um, went hard and fast when they hit the market. And they can be a good transition food. However, there's a couple of things to be aware of. The protein amount seems similar, but they can have excess fat, sugar, and salt. So as any food that you're picking up that's not whole in its original form, the way it was grown, you always want to read the label. And labels can be very misleading. Um, side note, it's not on the slide, but there's a really good 40-ish minute video from Jeff Novick on his website. He's a registered dietitian on how to read a nutrition label. Um, and you can see all the deceptive things, even with the new laws and updating uh, the nutrition labels, how they really get you at the store and get you thinking that you're doing something great when you may not actually be doing something great. So with anything processed, just, you know, sort of consumer beware, really work to educate yourself. Um, again, there's a lot that are made with coconut oil. Coconut oil is about 90% saturated fat. It will definitely raise your cholesterol level, your risk of fatty liver and heart disease. Um, so be really careful with that. Um, I was just watching a film series um, where they promoted the benefits of heart healthy coconut oil. It's really not your friend. Um, you may see people in marathons and Ironman triathlons that are using goops and gels that have coconut oil in there. It's a medium chain triglyceride, but they're using that as fuel during the race. Most of us are not burning that amount of calories. We we're not expending that amount of energy in our day to day lives. Um, so, you know, unless you're one of those elite athletes, um, probably really good to stay away from coconut oil. Uh, the plant-based meats do contain uh, fiber. They may provide fewer calories than their animal-based alternatives. 
Um, they don't generate trimethylamine, um, which eventually gets converted to trimethylamine oxidase, which is linked with heart disease, nor do they contain new 5 GC, which is contained in animal products, um, which is linked to cancer. Um, it, there's less chance of fecal contamination and foodborne illnesses, um, and it utilizes less water and land and less greenhouse gas emissions, and it's better for the overall welfare of the animals. Um, if you are working to transition to a whole food plant-based diet, you know, the plant-based meat alternatives can be um, a, a good transition. To make them part of your everyday diet and eating them, you know, at least one meal a day, um, probably not ideal. Again, they can be very high in salt, sugar, and fat, all which can contribute to heart disease. And actually, um, uh, salt is the number one nutrient that really contributes to um, morbidity and mortality in the standard American diet. Next slide, please. Um, so animal protein, uh, I'm sorry, plant-based protein is equally as good as building muscle as plant-based protein. Um, again, animal protein can be associated with kidney overload, um, but it's not the case if you're taking in excess plant protein. Um, the National Kidney Foundation actually recommends a whole food plant-based diet, and there's a link in the slides there if anyone is interested. Um, the methionine, even though it's an, it's an essential amino acid, if we get too much of it, as it is in meats, it actually can promote cancer. And you want to look at the packaging, and I don't mean necessarily the physical packaging, but how is that protein packaged? Is it in a plant fiber or an animal fiber? So in plant fiber, right, plant foods, it's antioxidants, fibers, phytochemicals, um, but in animal foods, it's cholesterol, endotoxins, um, heme iron, the new five um, GC, saturated fats, choline, which gets converted to trimethylamine, which gets converted to trimethylamine oxidase, which is linked to heart disease. Next slide, please. So when you focus only on a certain macronutrient like protein, you do miss on other things like complex carbohydrates, fiber, micronutrients, phytonutrients, et cetera. When we go to the store, we don't buy a single micronutrient. We don't go to buy, you know, protein. We go to buy food. Next slide. And Again, we're not a country that's protein deficient. We are a country that's fiber deficient. And I'm not gonna read through this whole slide, but all of these diseases, if you increase fiber by a certain amount, um, 10, 10 grams or so a day and more, you decrease your risk of death from heart disease, uh, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's really important not to focus only on protein and at the expense of fiber. Next slide. Also quick note on fiber, you know, there's different forms, soluble and insoluble. It's a little complicated, but as long as you're getting a good variety, you're gonna get um, the, the amount of both insoluble and soluble fiber you need to help with everything uh, from, you know, stooling correctly to clearing, uh, feeding your gut microbiome and clearing your out toxins in your body. Next slide. Okay, so quiz. Do these contain protein and all nine essential amino acids? Yes. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so this is really interesting. We might spend a minute or two on this. What is the calorie per gram of protein versus meat? Next slide, please. So if you look across this table, we're going to focus on the green line. And we're going to pick a food like salmon because people are like, oh, salmon is great. I'm going to get my omega threes. You know, people say I should eat, you know, you know, maybe a serving or two of fish a week. So let, we're going to do this. This is um, protein content per pound. And some people will say, but I don't eat a pound, but it's very easy to eat a pound of animal food because it's a very small amount compared to a pound of a plant food, right? It's a much larger volume. So that's why we break down this table and we do calories uh, or protein content per calorie per pound because it gives you um, an equivalent ratio. So if you look at salmon, you get 0 0.109 um, grams of protein per calorie, but look what you get in spinach. It's more, right? Uh, 0.128. Pretty interesting. If you, and I have people say, well, I eat 20% lean beef, right? So you get 0.068 grams of protein per calorie, right? But look at kale has the same amount, 0 0.066. Broccoli has more, 0 0.084. Um, lentils have more, 0 0.0844, right? Um, and 
Peas are very similar as well too. Peas are a great source of protein, 0.067 grams of protein per calorie. This is really important. But now let's look at the calories in this pound, right? So if you're eating a pound of peas, like let's pick this one, um, it can, uh, it's 367 calories per pound. Uh, a pound of salmon, 830. It's very easy for people to eat half pound burgers, right? Um, so even if you did a half pound burger, you're still at 600 calories, right? The peas are still ha almost half of that. But then let's look at the saturated fat content. So if you're looking at the saturated fat content, all plants have fat and saturated fat, but it's very low. Look at the beef. It's 34.8 grams per pound, right? Even if we cut that in half, you know, we're looking at still 16, um, 17 grams per pound. The salmon, 9.98 of saturated fat, almost 50 grams of total fat. But something that's even more insidious and more interesting is the trans fats. Um, trans fats um, are definitely linked to heart disease. Um, we should not be eating trans fats. And when we're eating our favorite processed vegan foods and anything that contains like, uh, 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 you know, like crackers or chips that contain partially hydrogenated whatever, um, if it has less than 0 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving, they can list it on the label as zero. We need to stay away from those. And so here you can see naturally in beef, chicken are trans fats. So these are not heart healthy choices. Even, and I, I made it with skinless and with the skin on. So you can see in both cases, it's not heart healthy. Um, so it's really interesting to look at how much protein you're actually getting per calorie. And you can see it's nearly equivalent in the plant-based world. Next slide, please. So we would be remiss to have this without talking about greenhouse gases and climate. Um, it's a real thing. And um, livestock production is definitely the number one cause of environmental destruction. And livestock production is actually reverse protein generation. It takes 12 pounds of grain to make one pound of beef protein. So we should be putting our resources into the 12 pounds of grain to feed the humans and not necessarily um, using it to feed the beef that people are going to eat, which we know causes disease. 12,000 gallons of water for 10 pounds of beef, that's enough for a family of four for a year. Um, if you do the math on that, an average beef cow is about 440 pounds. That's 528,000 gallons of water per cow. So people in the Southwest United States, Arizona, New Mexico, like Utah, um, Nevada, looking at those parts of the country that are going to be running out and are running out of water, um, we need to really seriously think about this. Um, there's also nutrient, um, a nutrient waste is destroying, and I'll show you a slide on this, not only the water um, and our air and atmosphere, but like we think about the water specifically, like the phytoplankton and algae blooms. So the bacteria in the water will then eat those algae. They're consuming oxygen. They're expiring carbon dioxide, which is creating dead zones in the water. So fish can't live there. Plants can't live there. Um, and it, it really is destructive um, to a lot of industry. Um, so the standard American diet uses two football fields, um, each to feed uh, one person per year, two football fields. Whole food plant-based diet can feed 14 people. So when we talk about, um, you know, access to food and growing food, there's definitely enough food to, to feed people in the world, but we need to do it appropriately in the right food so that we are targeting the most people. Uh, Five billion football fields worth of land could be returned to the forest if everyone went whole food plant-based. And, and as we're losing the forest and the rainforest, we're also losing species. Um, and that's going to be devastating to us as well in the future. Um, next slide, please. So this is a real picture. Um, this is not a cartoon. Uh, this is a satellite image of the um, agricultural runoff um, and also industrial runoff from cities and farms in 2019. Um, I lived in New Orleans for a while. The dead zone in the Gulf is real. And it's estimated that over 60% of the agricultural runoff in the United States goes through the Mississippi River. So there's a lot of people that say, well, fish is good for me, but you have to think about all the, the PFASs and PFASs, the mercury, all the contaminants, all those chemicals, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium um, that's creating that toxic environment that you're then ingesting um, in that fish and in, those, in that food as well. Um, but this is real. It's a real photograph. Next slide, please. So easy ways to increase protein in our diets. Uh, besides ordering from like great places that will deliver to you, like Whole Harvest, which is a great delivery service. Um, for breakfast, you can 
have overnight oats with hemp seeds, nuts, dried fruits. You can have green smoothies that are fortified with uh, lots of seeds and um, nuts uh, and kale and bananas. You can make homemade granola, scrambled tofu for lunch. You could have tempeh Reuben, tofu or black bean veggie burgers, chickpea based tuna, uh, non tuna salad sandwiches, Buddha bowls for dinner. You can have the same thing you had for lunch, but also add spaghetti with lentil balls instead of meatballs. Uh, power green salads, bean salads, Thai curries, Indian curries with lentils or soy, and even for snacks or desserts. You can make delicious cookies and brownies with black beans, which are great. Um, Brenda Davis has a great new book, Plant Power Protein, and um, I've just had some great cookies from them. You just got to be careful not to have too much. And chia pudding. So these are all ways to add protein or make sure you have enough protein in your diet. Next slide. And we always talk about you can take control of your own health. Next slide. Um, don't forget, we are focusing on nutrition here, but don't forget activity, avoiding toxins like smoking, getting adequate restorative sleep, stress reduction, relationships or time out are all important. I like to add time outdoors and purpose and finding joy because these all make a difference to your health. Next slide. So Dr. O'Connor and I would love to thank you for listening and, and Anthony too. We're from Love Life Telehealth and very much appreciate you guys listening. If you need any specific um, treatment or questions answered, please come contact us. And I think the next slide is just, you know, some of the resources that are really good. Oh, and well, actually this is lots of, there's 10 of us doctors at Love Life Telehealth. So we are in every single state in DC and we can see people overseas. And so, um, and, and love my partners. Next slide. And then if you want references, uh, we just put this on here that you can look later on at some of the great references that we looked at to do this lecture. And we're ready for questions. Very interesting. I have a couple of questions, but let's start with from the chat box first. Anthony had a question. Do you want to read your question, Anthony? Or sure. When you were thank you. Um, when you were talking about the um, amino acids and how the proteins kind of uh, how we break down the food into amino acids and then that assembles into proteins and stuff. I've also heard, but I don't really understand very well that that we our bodies also recycle those amino amino acids as yeah. we go throughout the day and we break down proteins. So it's not like we need what my understanding and what I would like to ask if it's true and then understand more is we don't need a hundred percent input of protein, you know, for in our food at any given point because our body is constantly breaking down proteins into amino acids and then reassembling them into the new proteins our bodies need. Um, how does that work in the real world? And um, is it something that plays into our daily protein um, requirements? Um, Kim, do you want me to start? Go for it. So our cells are wonderful. There's a mechanism in, inside the cells called a proteasome, and that's the proteasome's job, right? Is to degrade proteins, recycle, you know, proteins to, um, so it, it's working at a cellular level every day. Um, and that's why we need to consume on a consistent basis, a variety, you know, varied diet. Um, Cause those proteins are being broken down again. The, the, they last less than two days, um, but they, and we don't store the proteins um, other than our DNA, which due to, you know, repair mechanisms, you know, we're about 18 to 20% protein in our body. Um, and our DNA makes up a significant part of that. But it's that cellular proteasome that that's that mechanism that helps um, to recycle those um, amino acids. And Dr. so, Schoyer. yeah, there used to there was once a book or a study that came out that said we had to eat, eat proteins together. We had to complement proteins like rice and beans. But actually, you don't need to do that. And even the person who wrote that that um, that information recanted later because. As you mentioned, they we break it down. So if I eat vegetables now, like um, rice now, and then beans later, it's all broken down and then remade later. So it doesn't have to be at the exact same time. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. There's another question here. If someone does not have signs of protein deficiency, can they assume they're eating enough protein? I think so. If you have good energy and no signs of protein deficiency in this country, 
there is almost zero, unless you have a medical disorder or something like that, um, that we listed on our thing, you should be fine without that. You should realize that you probably don't have protein deficiency. If you're eating enough calories, generally speaking, you're getting enough protein in this country and probably too much. And again, go back to the questions that we asked earlier, like how much protein am I really getting? You can plug things into chronometer and, you know, take a, you know, a couple of two or three days worth of, um, uh, dietary intake, plug it into chronometer and see how much protein you're actually getting. If you live in a food desert and you're mostly ultra processed foods, it may be a little bit of an issue. You'll still be getting protein. It may not be good, high quality protein. But, um, but really check, like do the math, do the homework, how much are you really getting, um, before, um, trying to add more or worried about not getting enough. And generally speaking, athletes, professional athletes, they, as Dr. Schwer talked about, they don't supplement with proteins. They just eat so many more calories. You know, I think Michael Phelps is eating 12,000 calories a day. He was not taking any supplements, right? He was a competitive swimmer. One of the best swimmers that's ever graced, you know, an American pool. And, um, he was an eating machine. He would actually get tired of eating. He had to eat so many calories to keep that up. Um, but he never, you know, he's not taking protein supplements. He's doing it through food. And so by default, they're getting a huge amount of protein just because they're taking in a huge amount of calories. So if you get that rainbow, I mean, I did chronometer for a day just as out of curiosity and I calculated mine was 1.7 grams per kilogram, which is just insane without trying and without, um, using any supplements at all. So I had a couple of questions and that was one of them. So do we need to really concentrate on our protein or does it just fall into place when we're eating a well-structured whole food plant-based diet? Right. Yeah. And again, so, and Sid, it's a great question. And you really want to keep your protein intake at 10 to 15% of your total calorie intake. It should not be, you know, the center of your plate, right? It should be a portion of that plate, right? And without checking and without trying, when I did calculated mine was 15%. I don't want more than that. And, and it was, you know, I'm very, very athletic. So I don't, I never consider it. I never look at how much protein's on a, I mean, it's better to get food that doesn't have a food label, but I never look at the protein on a food label. I never consider it at all. And so just eat the variety, eat the rainbow, eat 30 different types of fruits and veggies and plant foods a week, and you'll be getting enough. Okay. I, don't, I have a couple questions about the slides. There was one slide where it showed the amino acids, then into peptides and then into proteins, but it said that there were less amino acids in peptides than protein. So the, the thing in the middle had less amino acids, the peptides had less amino acids than the final product. And that kind of confused me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. So the amino acids that are broken down form short chain peptides, right? So they're smaller by nature. A peptide's not a full protein, but then the peptides get assembled to make a big protein. So it's a, it's an intermediary step. So by default, they'll have less amino acids because it's a smaller molecule and it takes multiple peptides together to form a protein. I see. So if you think about it, if you're looking at a sentence, the sentence is a protein, the word is a peptide, and the letter is an amino acid. Good analogy. <laughs> Great analogy. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Scheuer. Yes. <laughs> and then when you were talking about proteins in general, you said there's 100,000 in the body. 100,000 amino acids or chains? What is that referring to, that 100,000? Different proteins. Different, different proteins. Pro yeah, that are all made up by the different, by the 20 amino acids. And of those 20, nine are essential. Oh, so it's kind of like the 26 letters of the alphabet. Only there's 20. Very good. Well, I've sure learned a lot. You know, I talk to so many people in my line of work and they, they think protein shakes are a good idea. And, you know, they've been advised by their trainers to be taking, you know, drinking these protein shakes and all of that. And so the, the myth persists, the myths do persist about protein. I think it's really fascinating. Um, and, and this I learned through study and then also through Christopher Gardner, um, through Stanford, he's so good, is that when that nitrogen comes off of that four element uh, molecule, the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, you're left with a carbohydrate. And we know if we're taking in excess energy, right, it's going to get stored potentially as fat 
as glucose, right? And um, excess calories that are stored, excess energy that's stored leads to overweight and obesity. And I see this in the gym, people who are there working out all the time and they have really, um, their bodies are not, the shape of their bodies is not proportionate to the amount of work they're doing in the gym. So, and, the, and there's a refrigerator there full of like protein shakes and protein bars and protein everything. So it really can be destructive. And it's so funny to me that people are using um, protein to gain muscle and to gain weight, but then they're also using it to lose weight. So I'm like, which one is which, you know? Mm -hmm. So last time we were together, um, Anthony and Dr. Kim, you, you talked about some Facebook live chats that Love Life Telehealth is doing. Would you like to tell us more about that? Sure, we've been on a short break for the Facebook live chats, but they will be coming back in October and they're twice a month. And what happens is a couple of the doctors get together and they have a discussion with the public. It's on our Facebook page. You can find our Facebook page just by searching for Love Life Telehealth on Facebook and join there. And then we'll create the events a little bit before the live sessions. And the uh, few doctors will go on and talk about a different topic and then they'll open up for Q and A. And they can't provide medical advice to people while they're doing their Q&A, but they can certainly answer general questions and they can help people to understand, um, you know, more detailed information, just like Dr. Uh, O'Connor and Dr. Scheuer shared today about protein. And they can help to people to understand if they do need to see a doctor or not or, uh, for some issues, you know, or for, not issues, I'm sorry, for some questions that they might be having. Mm -hmm. And they're fun. Right. They're fun. It's great to have access to incredible physicians uh, like Dr. Scheuer and Dr. O'Connor and just be able to ask them, you know, questions, things that you would always want to ask a doctor, but maybe you're not ready to book an appointment to ask just like one, you know, one question at a time, even if it's not about me personally, even if it's just a general question, something that's been on my mind that I would like a professional's um, perspective on. Would that information be in your newsletter? Yes. It comes out. Okay. So I encourage everyone to go to lovelifetelehealth.com and sign up for the newsletter. So you're kept apprised of these Facebook events, right? Yes, you get definitely. To talk yeah. To we, send out, we send out an email um, usually a few days before the, the live event happens with links so that you can click and subscribe and you can watch them. I keep calling them Facebook lives, but they also stream directly to YouTube for people who don't use oh. Facebook and they um, stream on LinkedIn as well. So anywhere that you have them, they'll go live. And if you ask, if you type in a question on any one of those three platforms, they come in so that they can get answered. Perfect. Well, before we sign off, um, I want everyone to know there'll be a replay of this. Be sure to watch it so you can get this information. Again, this was packed with really good information. And if you have any questions, you could go to uh, email connect at pbnsg.org if you have any questions about the video. Now, before we end, is there anything else you'd like to share about love life or anything else? Parting words of wisdom? So there, there is a question <laughs> here that came up. I noticed it said, oh. is there a recipe book um, that gives a day-to-day -day direction on meal planning to include protein needed? If you're just eating, again, 30 whole food plant-based, um, uh, a variety of 30 different whole food uh, plants in a, in a week is what you want to get. That's actually what we need to feed our microbiome that feeds us and it will produce all of the stuff we need. And again, a variety, um, again, you only want your total protein intake to be about 10 to 15% of your calories. The bulk of that should be really be coming from complex carbohydrates, right? So your, your dietary intake, you know, given, um, you know, without the extremis of some significant health issues, um, generally speaking about probably 60 to 65% complex carbohydrates. So the protein should be very low, um, 10 to 15%. And the China study really lays that out. If no one has read that, it's, a, it's just an excellent book. And if you are looking for a book that is quite good, it's Plant Power Protein by Brenda Davis that just came out. And it talks about protein at all ages and all activities. Again, though, you don't need to think about it. It's like... Yeah. We don't encourage you to count calories. We don't encourage, we don't think about how much fibers in every meal. If you have those great variety of plants, it, nature does its own thing. It gives the body what, what it needs automatically. Your body is an amazing machine. Amazing, amazing. 
isn't that called selective absorption where the body chooses what it needs uh, to function that day, right? That's what I've been taught to understand. Selective absorption for sure, but we override that with processed foods. So mm. that's why we like people to have processed foods because then it overrides the body's natural ability to selectively absorb what it needs. And then the same thing with like iron. If you're eating animal products, you have heme iron versus plant products that don't that have iron in it, but not heme iron. And the body absorbs the heme iron, all of it, whereas in animal products, so you can get too much and it can cause damage. Whereas with plants, it, it absorbs selectively what you need. So that's, you're right. There is selective absorption, but definitely avoid the ultra processed and processed foods. There are um, two good books out there that talk about how our systems are hijacked. And one is um, Hooked by Michael Moss. And the other one is Ultra Processed People by Dr. Chris Van Tolkien. They're both very good books. And it talks about how the food, how foods um, with lots of chemicals really hijack our systems. Um, so um, as you start to eat differently and you eat whole food plant-based, right, your taste buds change within a couple of weeks, um, you'll begin to really feel better. You may not need to eat as much. You may have a feeling of satiety that you've never had before. Um, so again, um, you, you don't need to focus on the protein, just focus on the variety of the foods. Perfect. Well, I encourage everyone to go to the Love Life Telehealth website and sign up for the newsletter at the very least. And if you need medical advice, check them out. They have 10 doctors, right? That cover all 50 states. Yeah. Perfect. And, and we have a variety of services from, um, from individual appointments, either 30 or 60 minutes, as well as uh, year long programs. And we have three levels of year long programs, depending on what someone's looking for, what their personal health and wellness goals are, what their medical conditions are, and, um, and what kind of support they need in between. So yeah, please take a look and check it out. We appreciate you sharing that, Sid. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't see any other questions. So thank you so much for your time, everyone. And it's been a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And thanks for the great information. Thanks again. It's been, for wonderful. It's been wonderful, Sid. Thank you.